After the proclamation of God's word this morning, we'll sing in response from the very psalm that we now hope to consider together in the proclamation of God's word, Psalm 4, all stanzas. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's likely not an overstatement to say that most, if not all of us, have experienced some degree of distress as a result of forgetfulness. And here I am thinking specifically of forgetting parts of the Word of God. I'm thinking of the distress you can experience when you are, let's say, very aware of your own depravity, but forget God's declaration of His sovereign love. Maybe life has become burdensome. Maybe you've recently lost a job. Maybe you're experiencing more than your share of hardships in family life. You have tension, perhaps, in your marriage, strife in the family, straying from the Lord and from his church. Perhaps you've shed a lot of tears lately because you sharply experienced the brokenness of this life. Trouble makes us doubt, makes us forget at times the Lord's declaration of his love for us, especially because we know who we are, we're small, finite, depraved. So yes, trouble should be coming our way. It should be our lot in life. I don't deserve any better. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, our thinking about God needs correction. It's, of course, more than sometimes. But sometimes we need to see that, yes, God does send us trouble, but it is, you might say, valuable trouble. And this is where Psalm 4 becomes so helpful. This morning, the Holy Spirit would bolster our confidence that yes, God really does love his people, depraved though we still very much are. It's a confidence that the author of the psalm, King David, had. David knew that the Lord had set David apart for his purposes. He didn't doubt it, but he accepted it. His confidence in this psalm is instructive for us. God, our righteous and holy God, reaches down from heaven to show us his favor. Yes, God, our righteous and holy God, hears the prayers of his people in their trouble, and he works to increase their faith. And so with that, I am going to proclaim to you this word of the Lord. The Lord has set apart the godly for himself. We're going to find this in David's confidence, David's counsel, David's confession. So first, David's confidence. It's quite obvious from reading this psalm that its author is in peril. Psalm 4 is a psalm of lament. Some have pointed out that Psalm 4 can probably be paired up with Psalm 3, which seems to be a morning prayer, while our text appears to be an evening prayer. We should note that the psalms of lament are numerous in the Psalter. So many psalms begin the way Psalm 4 does. That's quite encouraging, actually, uh, to see that as you move through the psalms. They're not presenting some, say, pie-in-the-sky picture of the Christian life. No, they often start out with a feeling of being forgotten by the Lord. Some lament about sickness. There's often frustration. There are enemies hounding the psalmists, misjudging them, humiliating them. We often find the psalmist starting out with a feeling of being overwhelmed. Now, we're not entirely sure of the historical background to Psalm 4. As I just said, some have paired it with Psalm 3. There's similar terminology, and there's a similar flavor between the two. 
So it's quite possible that the historical background is similar. And David wrote Psalm 3 after he had fled Jerusalem when his son Absalom took over the throne. That's, uh, 2 Samuel 15 through 18 records all that. Psalm 4 may very well also have been written during that period of time. King David, in other words, is likely still in exile. He's probably still on the run, which is already striking. He's the one appointed by God to establish peace and stability in the land. He's God's representative ordained by God to reflect God's justice and mercy to his people. But he's not receiving the respect and support that his office asks for. He's bearing the brunt of his people's uprising. He's experiencing injustice, and he recognizes this as a crisis situation. Well, in this crisis, David again prays. He turns to the Lord for help. <coughs> the striking thing, however, is that in David's crisis, we don't read of despair. Instead, we find David quite calm. Why is that? The reason is that he knows a thing or two about his God. We see this in David's vocabulary in verse 1. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. David knows God's character. In other words, David is calling him the God who will show me to be in the right, even though I am being misjudged and dishonored. David has confidence that God has committed himself to the godly. So when the godly endure uprising, when their innocence is attacked by false accusations, they can appeal to the God of their righteousness to assess their situation and vindicate their right. David calls upon God to be the witness to his own conduct, David's own conduct, and put him in the right. The psalmist puts God's character first and foremost in his prayer. Now just imagine that you have been falsely accused. You've been misjudged. And you know you've not done it. But others are all over this, building up a case against you. You're being, you're being hauled to court, so you have to hire a lawyer to defend your innocence. You're looking for justice. Well, if you can sort of put yourself in that kind of situation where you have to defend yourself, especially then in a situation where you're on trial for your faith, Psalm 4 is the place to go for strength. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Yes, O God, who in the face of all the slanders from my enemies can vindicate me, exonerate me, defend my right. With this title, David honors his God. His desire, congregation, is that his cause would be recognized as right. He's, you see, appealing to the goodness of God, which is, of course, a good way to start your prayers. Seek the Lord according to his goodness. Well, as we move along in this, in this first verse, we see that David's confidence is rooted in more than the fact that God is the God of his right. His confidence is also based on the fact that he has experienced the help of God in the past. You have given me relief when I was in distress. David is remembering that God has already poured out his benefits upon his servant. And it's the recalling of God's past grace that gives David strength and confidence for the time to come. Now, this word here for distress carries the idea of being squeezed into a tight spot. David, 
who is currently in a very tight spot, recalls those other times in his life when his God gave him relief, when he made space for David. David is saying, when I was hammed into a tight place, you made space for me. God opened up a way of escape for him when he was buffeted on all sides, besieged on all fronts. But how often that happened to David. Just think of his relationship with King Saul. But David has learned in this and other experiences that God does make space for his people whom he has set apart. And how often does this vocabulary not fit with our lives? We can find ourselves in a tight spot, different from David, most likely, but besieged, nevertheless, in our situations, besieged on all forces, on all fronts, by sin and evil. It can become suffocating as we look for a way out from Satan's attack. And yet, while this distress may overpower us, it often does, it cannot overpower God. So how do you respond to being in a tight spot? As David did, consider your Lord. Consider that he has set apart the godly for himself. And in that relationship, he's the God who gives space. Remember that. Know who your God is. He gives relief, grace, David says, be gracious to me and hear my prayer. David pleads for God's grace because he's in a helpless condition. Yet, his situation of desperation doesn't leave David in despair. David has total confidence in the Lord that the Lord's going to hear him because of who the Lord is and how he works, how he has worked in covenant history in David's own life. In this first verse of David's prayer, he declares the character of his God. He remembers God's tender mercies. And in confidence, he pleads for God to show himself again in David's life. Yes, he hones in on God's goodness and then simply pleads for God's grace. See that David here is in prayer, worshiping. Biblical prayer meditates on God. As David's prayer is full of confident worship of his God, who has set apart the godly for himself. We've seen that in verse 1. We see it even further in verses 2 through 5, where David speaks words of counsel for those who opposed him. So that brings us to our second point, where we see that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself, and we find that in David's counsel. So in these verses, verses 2 through 5, David turns from speaking to the Lord, you might say, to now addressing others, those who have given him a lot of trouble in recent days. And as it turns out, he tells his enemies that they are playing rather dirty. They're being dishonest. They're mudslinging. They were bringing empty charges against David. They were turning David's glory into shame, as he says at the beginning of verse 2. Yes, they are slandering the reputation of the king. And here in our text, he denounces them for it. He confronts them and their attitudes. Oh, man, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? the honor of the Lord's anointed being attacked. Now, of course, we probably can't help but think of our Savior here. 
He had his share of enemies during his earthly ministry. Instead of praising him for his preaching and for his miracles of healing and raising from the dead and casting out demons, they smeared his ministry. They talked bad about him. They spread lies about him. They said he's a glutton and a drunkard because he hangs out with tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes. Others said he's got an evil spirit, this man. <clears throat> Others still called him a blasphemer because he thinks he's God. What defense does the godly have in response to false charges? A mighty defense. Here is where we come in our text to that powerful expression of our theme. Verse 3, David says, But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. Well, who is the godly one? David is referring to himself as king. <clears throat> The word, the Hebrew word that David uses here is chassid. If you're a history buff, you may know that during the time of the Lord Jesus, there was a group of Orthodox rabbis known as the Hasidim. That's where the <clears throat> Hasidic Jews of today find their origin. So a chassid is a pious Jew. And it's related, that word chassid, godly one, is related to another Hebrew word which lies at the very heart of the Old Testament. And that's the word chesed, which stands for God's covenant lo unfailing love. And so a chassid is one who has received the Lord's chesed, his covenant unfailing love. He's received it by faith. He's heard God's promises and embraced them. He's the opposite of those who love vain words and seek after lies. Those whose life is one big contradiction because uh, between who they are in public and in private. They are not godly. They are godless. David's defense in response to the false charges then is this. He knows that he, as Hasid, has received the Lord's unfailing covenant love, and he, as the Lord's anointed, is striving to love the Lord in return. And this Lord has set apart this godly one for himself. Not because he's perfect. Godly doesn't mean that. David knew himself a sinner, and he wrote the Psalms to prove it. The godly are those loved abundantly by God who respond by loving him back, though it be imperfectly. These, David says, the Lord has set apart for himself. David knows, beloved, that he stands under the protection, the watchful care eye of the Lord. That's his defense against the lies of the enemy. And it's ours as well. When people try to smear the Lord, or the Lord's people, we may respond with this exhortation, this counsel to the world. Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. He protects them during danger and attack. He's made a distinction between his people and his enemies. That started at our baptism. That's where we came, you might say, under the special protection of the Lord at his initiative. That's where God proclaimed his love for us. And again, we see that in the life of the Lord Jesus. At the beginning of his public ministry, <clears throat> his heavenly father set him apart through baptism. God said to him, 
you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now that sounds an awful lot like Psalm 4, verse 3. <clears throat> you are my son whom I love. You are my godly one. I have set you apart for myself. And our Savior could return to that reality throughout his ministry. He was constantly in a tight spot. He was constantly in crisis mode. His honor was constantly turned into shame. And all those accusations were continually thrown at him. But he could recall the promise of his father made to him at his baptism. That's for us too. We see in Psalm 4 <clears throat> that the weapon of the righteous one be, who becomes an object of malicious slander is to remember how God re regards him in Christ. Today, Christians will also have times when they have to deal with slander that puts them down. And then even their fellow church members doubt that God will show them some good. Psalm 4 encourages especially the believer in crisis to continue to trust that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. And therefore, the godly has access to him. That's verse 3b. The Lord hears when I call to him. Well, that's marvelous. The godly can bring it all before God and with David can know that he will hear. David has further counsel to pass on in verses 4 and 5. He's still here speaking to his enemies and now he exhorts them to repentance. Be angry and do not sin. More literally it says tremble and do not sin. Trembling, that word carries the sense of shaking and fearful awe. I think the King James captures the meaning the best when it says, stand in awe and sin not. It's a very intense picture here. David is rousing his enemies from their inner peace. He calls, as it were, Absalom and his company to repent before the Lord in trembling awe because of their sin of falsehood and conspiring against the psalmist, the godly one. <clears throat> he follows that by saying, ponder in your own hearts on your own beds and be silent. That's further helpful instruction for those conspiring against the psalmist. Don't sin. Reflect on yourself and what reckless behavior you've been involved in. Search your hearts and be silent. And so trembling and silence that motivates, that encourages reflection and is also the result of reflection. It's the response of repentance. Verse 5 adds to that, offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. This is David further calling his enemies to repentance. It's as though he's calling out to Absalom and his cohorts, go to the, ta the, the, the tabernacle, go to the priests, offer right sacrifices, seek atonement for your sin, repent, become right with the Lord. Trust not in your own army, your own popularity, your own clever strategies, but in the Lord. <coughs> David calls for a change of their heart. That's the only way the wrath of God can be turned aside. It's remarkable that the psalmist does not ask for God's wrath to be poured out upon his enemies. Rather, he appeals to them to repent. David was a good king, as well as a loving shepherd. He compels the unrepentant to turn from his sins, to be reconciled to God through the sacrifice of atonement, and to trust 
in the Lord. David is talking to his own brethren. So his words are for the church. There's something here for us as well. When your neighbor, beloved, whoever that's going to be, is slandering the name of Christ, whether by word or by deed, do you have the boldness to speak out and call him to repentance and to serve God in a reverent way? I guess that could be your unbelieving neighbor. It could also just as well be a fellow saint who isn't offering the right sacrifices of repentance to the Lord. We are to confront and rebuke with humility, yes, also with boldness. For Jesus Christ deserves full honor and glory. So we come to our final point where we see David's confession. And so we see in the last place here that how the Lord's setting apart of the godly for himself comes out indeed in David's confession. We find in these final verses of Psalm 4 that, uh, that these, in these verses there are no longer deliberate enemies of the king, but these are doubters, you could say, discouraged by their current circumstances. David contrasts their reaction to his that he had uttered in verse 1. His own heart was burning for the Lord. He reflected on who his God was, the God of his right, the God who gives space, gives relief. David had a desire for God to show himself once again. But these many of verse 6 are in distress, and they don't share David's burning desire. They wonder, who will show us some good? Now that good refers here to the good things of the so-called good life. Good things that perish, like grain and wine mentioned in verse 7. David doesn't set his heart's desire on these things. He puts no value on the perishable good things. Instead, what does he say to those asking these kinds of questions? He prays some words very familiar to us. He takes part of the benediction that the priests proclaimed over Israel in the worship service, the benediction we still receive today. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. David takes those very familiar words and turns them into a prayer. Lift the light of your face upon us, O Lord. David actually believes that blessing. He's heard it all his life. For David, it's not merely a sign that the tabernacle worship service is at its close. It's not merely some biblical way of saying the end. No, it's so much more than that. David is reminding us that sometimes what you need in order to move forward is found right in the worship service. What is so familiar to you? That takes you through all the challenges and crises in life. That blessing which you have heard all your life is what you need. That's what David prays for as well. David is content with the favor of God alone. It's his deepest longing. And it illustrates then to us what our longings should be. The godly, whom the Lord has set apart, are all to seek the light of his face the manifestation, the display, the giving of his favor and love. That longing is supposed to be the number one in your life, above all other longings you may have. Is it? As you are busy in your daily affairs, is 
the favor and the love of God shining upon you, your deepest longing. And does it not only feature in your prayers, but does it actually mean the world to you? Does it mean more to you than the thing to which you hold most dearly in this life, the thing you're most thankful for in this life? Your spouse, your children, your earthly possessions. Pray with David, Lord, lift up the light of your face upon us. For the truth is, that light of the Lord's face shining upon the godly produces true joy. David says as much in verse 7, You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. Yeah, David has a gladness that trouble, distress, cannot destroy. <clears throat> His longing for God is so strong that having received the wealth of God's favor, David doesn't envy at all the wealth of others. While they lament in a less than godly way, he prays, you have put joy in my heart. He had, David had more satisfaction in seeing the countenance of God the favor of God, the love of God, the grace of God beaming upon him than if he had garners overflowing with grain and cellars bubbling over with wine. A good and fitting and blessed relationship with the Lord provides the psalmist with more joy than those who seek happiness in material goods. Can you say the same, brothers and sisters? Can you say that you find more satisfaction in the wealth of God's favor than in your material circumstances, whatever they are? Who or what has your heart more? Who or what gives you the most joy? God-given and God-directed joy is vastly more important and please, more fulfilling than all the food and wealth the world can give you. David closes off this psalm by confessing that he also enjoys deep and abiding peace. In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. The enemies of the king, we read back in verse 3, they diligently ran after worthlessness and falsehood in order to frustrate the king. Others, they chased after prosperity, wondered where it had gone. David, he's not worried about the outcome. David's sleep is rooted in a belief, a trust that God is his sustainer and protector. David, you see, committed his ways to the Lord. He experienced peace, the peace that comes as a great blessing from God. As he's gone in this psalm from trouble to peace, the way that David gets from trouble to peace is through delighting in his God. It's quite possible, brothers and sisters, that You've come to worship today with a lot of struggles on your heart. And perhaps you do think, look, how can I truly, really sleep in peace? Remember the Psalms. From trouble to peace through prayer. David's confidence in the Lord alone is the reason for his peaceful sleep. But really, congregation, how can this all be? How can David have this confidence? David of all people, David the adulterer, the murderer, 
All of that is in his not so distant past as he writes this song. How can that man be considered a godly one after everything he'd just done not that long ago? David was looking ahead by faith to the one God had promised to send, to the coming king who would be the godly one, the chassid. In that godly one, the light of the Father's face would shine out on this dark world. Jesus did not come to experience abundant grain or wine himself, even though he did multiply bread to feed others and change water into the best of wine. During his ministry, he didn't even have a bed of his own on which to lie down and sleep. He was not surrounded all, to, all around him by followers who loved him. Instead of honoring him as the godly one, the glorious one, people spat on him, beat him, put him to shame on the cross. O oh men, O oh world, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? Jesus knew what it was to be surrounded by many enemies, to feel deep suffering and pain to feel the deepest shame at the cross, which was actually the place of the greatest honor of all, the place where our righteous God vindicated sinners by establishing a new righteousness for all those who are in Christ by setting apart his godly one to experience his wrath against sin, God made it possible for us now to know and enjoy and bask in the light of his face. At the cross, God offered the perfect sacrifice so that we all may lie down and sleep in peace and dwell in safety, no matter the circumstances. Yes, a safety that no trial, no temptation, no sin can touch. It's at the cross that we can receive relief from the greatest distress of all, the distress of our sin. <clears throat> now, even former adulterers and murderers like David can come into God's holy presence and fellowship washed by Christ's blood and enabled to sing his praises. And if they can, so can we. <clears throat> As we are joined to Christ by faith, we too can be counted among the godly. We too, broken as we are, can be accepted as God's beloved children and feel the warm light of his radiant smile upon us for the sake of Christ. Psalm 4 has been used by believers throughout the ages as an evening prayer or song. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Sleeping <clears throat> is a testimony that you are not sovereign. The world will function without you. Even more, sleeping testifies that God is sovereign. So if you come to the end of your day and you struggle to lie down in peace, follow the example of the psalmists. Bend your knee and lay hold by faith the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, the peace that will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The Lord has set apart the godly for himself. Seek your father's face as the source of your true joy. No matter your distress, you will dwell securely in your father's arms forever. If you have God, you have everything you need for life and death. And that's reason for unending thanksgiving. Amen.